So our next speaker is Michelle Lowe. And Michelle came to this program after a decade in the dredging industry, where she worked in many coastal communities around the world. Her experiences highlight the importance of both economic and e ecological sustainability, and she's interested in helping communities make informed management decisions for the conservation of their nearshore marine resources. So for me, Michelle is one of these people that came to the program bringing a really unique and important perspective. Um, I think our program is most successful when we have a variety of perspectives and backgrounds and experiences. And I think that's how we have robust discussions and how we contribute to critical thinking over the course of the year. So for me, Michelle was really important um, for bringing that unique perspective. Something else that's cool about Michelle is that um, you'll, you'll see why, but over the course of this work on this project, she spent a lot of time tracing. And uh, you'll see what that means. But what it really means is she's listened to every podcast there is. So <laughs> if you want to know uh, about all the podcasts, uh, to the extending to the end of the internet, I think, uh, Michelle can fill you in on what's happening with each of them and probably make some really solid recommendations. So please join me in welcoming Michelle Lowe. Okay, so uh, this one. Okay, so um, my capstone project was uh, looking at the recovery of corals in Maui after a thermal bleaching event. Okay, um, in early 2015, a warm water mass began to form in the Pacific Ocean, increasing average sea surface temperatures. As this mass of warm water intensified, it affected areas on each side of the Pacific Ocean from Australia to the Pacific coast of North America. For coral reef ecosystems, 2015 marked the third global bleaching event, regarded as the longest and most widespread bleaching event ever recorded. The main Hawaiian islands were no exception, with, warm, with the warm water mass that approached in early July and stuck around until early November of that year. So, what is coral bleaching? During prolonged periods of above average water temperatures, corals expel their symbiotic algae, known as zooxanthellae, in the phenomenon known as thermal bleaching. Zooxanthellae are important to corals as they provide corals with a primary source of nutrition. They also provide color to the coral tissue. When corals bleach, the coral tissue appears white or translucent in color. After a bleaching event, corals can experience impaired growth, impaired reproduction, and partial mortality. However, a bleached coral is not a dead coral, although after a prolonged period without proper nutrition, a coral can die. Corals are colonial organisms. One colony is a group of genetically identical polyps. Hard corals, or stony corals, are especially important for coral reef ecosystems as they are reef-building organisms. As they grow, they create three-dimensional structure that is home to many organisms. Coral reefs are thought to have the most diversity per unit area of any marine habitat. In addition to biodiversity, reefs are also very important to many cultures around the world that have been built around them. The ancient Hawaiians relied on coral reefs for their overall survival, using them for subsistence, recreation, and cultural ceremonies. Economically, the coral reefs of the main Hawaiian islands contribute over $360 million per year to the state's economy. The island of Maui alone attracts almost 3 million visitors per year. So it is understandable that when the reefs of Maui bleached for the first time ever on record in the thermal bleaching event of 2015, that this caused concern and raised questions about the future health of Maui reefs. Questions like, how did the bleaching impact the most abundant reef-building coral species of Maui? Did the corals become smaller? Did they all die? How did the severity of the bleaching impact coral recovery? Did the corals that retained some of their symbiotic algae survive more often than the corals that completely bleached? And were all reef sites impacted in the same way? 
we were able to help answer some of these pressing questions by using a time series of thousands of images captured over a series of years from the peak of a bleaching event in November 2015 through to July 2017. The images were captured as part of a broader project here at Scripps called the 100 Island Challenge, which regularly monitors different locations around Leeward, Maui. In order to use the monitoring images to address our first question, if there is a change in size class after the bleaching event, a 3D reconstruction of each site at each time point was created using these images. On the screen is the example of one of the study sites, Oluwalu. This is the construction for November 2015, the peak of bleaching. You'll notice several white areas on the reef. These are the bleached corals. Oh, we'll watch it again. Uh, for my capstone project, I selected images from two of the monitoring locations, Kayakili and Oluwalu. The Kayakili study site is located within the Kayakili herbivore fisheries management area, which is an area that prohibits the fishing of herbivores. The Oluwalu study site has the largest area of reef on Maui, about 1,000 acres. However, it does not have a local fishing management plan other than state regulations. And the reef experiences regular sediment input from the now bare agriculture fields in the mountains above Oluwalu. Sediment exposure is especially noticeable after heavy rains that wash sediment from the land onto the reef. In order to use the 3D reconstruction that we just saw to determine if there's a size class change, the image was flattened, or the model, I'll call it, was flattened into a two-dimensional file so that the outline of each coral could be traced. Each individual coral was traced in Adobe Photoshop using a pen and tablet. Measurements taken in the field preserve the scale of the image. As some of the details lost in the flattened image, the raw images were referenced on an adjoining computer screen so that the extent of each of the colony's borders could be determined. We're looking at the series, the digitized series for Oluwalu in November 2015. For this study, only bleached corals were outlined. So the image on the left is the flattened um, 2D image from the three-dimensional model that we saw. The image in the middle is the image with all the bleached corals outlined and colored according to species. And then the last image is the image with all of the corals outlined, and that's the image that we get the size, uh, the area from of each coral. In addition to tracking the changes in size class, each bleached coral was assigned a bleaching level using November 2015 raw images. The spectrum of bleaching levels started with a level one, which was a colony that was not bleached at all, to a level four, which was a colony that was completely bleached and devoid of any zooxanthellae in the raw images. We hypothesized that corals that bleached less severely in 2015, so a level two bleaching, would survive more often than the corals that bleached at a level four in 2015. This is because, presumably, coral that does not appear completely white or translucent in color has retained some zooxanthellae and therefore has more energy to survive and compete with other corals. So, now the results of hundreds of hours of tracing corals. You'd think it'd be like more colorful or something, but um, <laughs> these plots are called quantile quantile plots, and they show us the comparison of the average sizes of the corals between years. When the points fall below the line, as they do on the left-hand plot, which is the Oluwalu study site, this shows us that the average size of the coral colonies at that site became smaller from 2015 to 2017. When the points land above the line, this shows us that the average size of colonies became larger from 2015 to 2017. And in a surprising and unexpected result, this was the case at the Kaikili study site. The average size of coral colonies became larger from 2015 to 2017. You'll notice that the point distribution is above the line on the left-hand plot, which is the Kayakili study site. The results of the Kayakili study site were surprising because after a bleaching event or other natural disturbance, we would expect the corals to have a period of reduced growth or even partial or full mortality. Considering the nature of this bleaching event and its severity, we were surprised to see the shift to larger size classes. So, why are the results different between the sites? 
Why did the Kaikili corals shift to larger size classes and the Oluwalu corals shift to smaller size classes? Some differences may be related to the composition of species at each study site. The Kaikili study site had more corals with upright growth forms than the Oluwalu site. The images on the screen are representative basically of the types of corals at each site, Oluwalu being on the left and Kaikili on the right. These growth forms would allow the corals to grow up off of the seafloor where sediment may accumulate. Another difference between the sites is that the Oluwalu site is chronically impacted by sediments from past agriculture activity. When the sediment is suspended in the water column, it blocks the sunlight from reaching the corals. The symbiotic algae in the corals needs the sunlight in order to provide the coral with energy. Anytime there are heavy waves, the sediment gets resuspended, contributing to the chronic issue. And lastly, the differences in size class changes between the study sites may be related to their local management. Kayakili is an herbivore fisheries management area where fishing for herbivores is prohibited. And Oluwalu, as I mentioned, is open to fishing subject to state regulations. Grazing fish are extremely important to reef health as they help control algae, which competes with the coral for space on the reef. And now, the bleaching level results. So recall that the second component of this study was to examine if the corals that bleached less severely in November 2015 had better recovery in um, July 2017. So if the level two corals fared better than the level four corals. This graph is combined with both sites into one graph. The bars on the graph are grouped according to coral species and bleaching level. Each bar represents, I'm sorry, yes, coral species and bleaching level. So it goes from um, bleaching level two, three, and four for one species and the same for the next group. Um, each bar represents the entire sample size for that particular species and bleaching level. For the sake of time, <laughs> we're going to focus on the gray color, which represents corals that died in the 2017 time point. We can see by looking at the gray color, which represents full mortality by 2017, that the percentage is higher for the coral that bleached at a level four than the corals that bleached at level two for most of the species sampled. Here we're looking at the species Parides lobata as our example. We can see that Parides lobata on this graph has 25% mortality at the bleaching level four versus 11% at the level two, and this is combined for both sites. So averaging across all the species sampled and both sites, the mortality for corals that bleached at a level two was approximately 32% by July 2017, and the mortality for corals that bleached at level four was approximately 42% by July 17. This supports our hypothesis that corals that bleach less severely in 2015 would have less mortality in 2017. This study tracked the path that corals take after a thermal bleaching event by using thousands of images to assess the severity of bleaching and the subsequent fate of the individual corals. As a result of tracking individual corals with different um, from sites with different management strategies, we were able to see that the trajectory of recovery was different between the sites. We saw the shift to larger corals at Kaikili and the shift to smaller corals at Oluwalu. We also found that for most species at both sites, less severe bleaching led to less severe mortality across both sites. Although managing for recovery certainly involves continued pressure at the global level to curb carbon emissions, Management of local human-induced stressors also plays a role in reef health and recovery. Efforts on Maui to manage reefs for recovery and incorporate complete watershed management have already started. One such effort is an initiative called Ridge to Reef, a collaboration between stakeholders to comprehensively manage the reef and the land. The Oluwalu Reef was recently named a hope spot by the Mission Blue Alliance led by the legendary oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Although the cause of warm water events cannot be fully addressed at a local level, comprehensive monitoring and planning can aid in the recovery of corals after a thermal bleaching event. And I would like to thank my advisory committee for their support, guidance, and feedback. And thank you to everyone who, uh, who provided input and support with the various stages of the project. Thank you.
Michelle, would you mind going back to the series of bars of the different species? Yes, thank you. So I was looking at the different species and I was getting a little confused because I see the first three species, the mortality goes from um, increasing from level two to level three to level four. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain the, the results for the last species listed there. I also see that there's um, a very small number of, of individuals sampled. Can you explain that a little bit more for us? Yeah, so um, remember that we tracked only bleached corals. So for that particular species, which is Poslopora meandrina, um, we only found one bleaching level two sample. Um, and then most of um, the rest of them fell in the severe bleaching, which is sort of like a um, life history characteristic that seems to be um, sort of typical with that species. So it seems like when they sort of bleach, or at least in the images that we captured, we found very few that were just um, any of the levels in between. So. Oh, I get, I get the microphone, ha <laughs> ha. Um, I was gonna ask what the percentage of bleaching was in these two different sites. So you, did you also, did you have any idea of like of counts or anything on the, on the unbleached population as opposed to these sorts of things? Um, I don't know the exact percentages, but I do know that the, um, at, I mentioned that Oluwalu is like a thousand acre reef. And so I know that the inshore portion of that reef bleached more severely than at Kayakili. Um, our study site was actually a little bit deeper water, but I know as a whole between like the whole reef sites that the Oluwalu site had more severe bleaching. Great job, Michelle. Um, I'm just wondering, based upon your knowledge of the reefs on Maui, how do you feel that the two sites that you selected kind of fit within the context of the severity of bleaching and or recovery that may have occurred across the island more broadly? Like, do you think Oluwalu's kind of got the worst trajectory? Are there places that are better than, than Kahikili and, and why? Like, does local management at those sites, do you think, play a role in the recovery? Um, I think, well, so I had the opportunity to visit Maui um, early in January. And I think from what I saw, um, Oluwalu doesn't have a lot of um, near shore, or I mean like right on the shoreline development as much as Kayakili. Um, but I think that I was impressed with what Oluwalu looked like. I thought that it looked okay for what I was expecting, given how badly um, I had read that it bleached. But the sediment is definitely noticeable. You can see like sediment rivers basically um, from like land sediment. So I think that uh, it has a chance, but I think that those issues have to be taken care of or managed. 